Ja, dann machen wir weiter. Ähm, wir haben jetzt den Ruben. Okay, then we continue. And now Ruben, working for Continental, and when Ruben and Marcel, when they had suggestion to have a look at learning from a different perspective, and Ruben, I think you sent me a sentence that came from a lecture, and I really uh, saw a lot of things that I've never seen in learning because it was about DNA and epigenetics. So how does learning help on a very, uh, sorry, work on a very biological way and uh, uh, it was like a presentation how Al-Qaeda uh, brainwashes people and turns around their reality. It's not like that. Um, but Ruben will tell you how working environments change our mindset and here we have this bad word. Whenever somebody says mindset, a little kitten will die. So we don't want kittens to die, though they're not that good for the environment, but this is not what's supposed to happen. But we want to have a look at learning environments and their influence on mindset. And Ruben, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Okay, and I just have to tell you that there was an applause. I heard it. Okay, so first of all, Simon, thank you very much. You almost literally said what I wanted to say as an introduction. So th it's really uh, great to see how well you understand. But I would like to thank you. How quickly you got the link going. That is from the pre-lecture from Biophysiology and Ascon. Uh, uh, human beings. And at the end of the day, I hope you all understand the link and that it really makes sense to get together and to exchange about learning environments. The title has already mentioned by Simon, so I get started immediately with a personal experience. A personal experience how I got to have a closer look at epigenetics. And I just need to frame you just a second. Sorry, no, that was not the right move. Okay, sorry, I have to... Okay, now. Whoops. Okay. Now I can see you. And could you please give a show of hand who likes wasps? That is in the room and also I can see four here. Uh, this is what I've thought. I've got a similar feeling about this. And imagine a couple of years ago with my former partner, my now wife, I'd been in Paris, wonderful weather, it was uh, good weather, and I ate a steak. And what happened? A wasp came. And what did I do? I ran away. I ran through the park and I was really extremely afraid of uh, this animal. It doesn't look funny, like a two meter man, 120 kilos, runs away of a bus. It was dramatic for myself and also for my wife, of course it was. And then I thought, how does it come that I am such a fright of wasps, fear of dying, this is not good, I need to do something about it. And this is why I got treated against wasp phobia. And at the end of the treatment, I was no longer afraid of wasps. I still think they're bad, but this phobia was gone. So not this death of dying when wasps come, I don't have to run away anymore. And so I asked myself, how is it possible to see that an external influence like therapy, uh, phobia treatment, really makes such an extreme reaction go away. And this brought me to researching epigenetics and in this context also to the nature nurture debate. What is this debate about? Well, this is the debate about what is said in nurture. There are two perspectives in psychology explaining behavior. In medicine, obviously, one tries to explain disease development. What is it about? Well, in psychology, one can say behavior can be explained either by the environment, that is nurture, that is in an extreme view, one would say 100% of behavior can be explained through environmental influence. And the very sharp 
uh, clear-cut approach is behaviorism. The brain is a black box. We're not interested. All the behavior human beings have can be explained and changed through environmental influence. You know the Pavlovian dog, uh, the bell rings when he gets uh, food. And at some point in time, the saliva starts even only if the alarm is ringing. This perspective is a bit overturned right now, outrun. But the other perspective is nature. That's classically medical perspective. They say anything in human behavior and also disease development can entirely be explained through genetic predisposition. So we've got our genetic code, the DNA, and this encodes what happens to us, how we behave, and in an extreme view, one might even say that the free will, uh, they say that one can uh, predict how one will behave in 10 years in free will. And I believe, and I think science will tell that both aspects are important, both play a role in the explanation of behavior. In biopsychology, one uses twin studies especially in genetically identical twins. And why is one doing this? Well, you have to mention you've got a copy of yourself which genetically is identical. And if you want to find out is a disease development or even a different behavior due to genetics or environment, then for genetically identical twins, I get the explanation because they are the same with regard to their toolbox. So if there is a difference, then it must have happened because of environmental influences. And I would like to present two really nice studies to you on this chart, which really represent this very well. First, the medical perspective, that is the research group TAN, then found out in 2014 that if you take two genetically identical twins, it can be that one develops a specific disease and the other one doesn't. And that's really you've got a genetically coded disease it's genetically identi identical so environmental influences must have triggered this not the dna that's not possible well you could do it today because of gen uh, technology but we're not talking about this today the other example that i would like to show you and which is far more important for our convention here is the nisbet et al study 2012 so you have to understand that that genetic uh, predispositions that is a preconditions for exceptional intelligence some have got a gene which predetermines like to say i've got the potential to become super clever and we've all have the potential to develop a certain intelligence in their study they found out that the people who've got this potential for exceptional intelligence they also need the learning environment to really see the development so that means it's not just sufficient to have this gene for super intelligence but you also need a learning environment which really favors all this otherwise it might happen that i cannot make use of my potential and these two trials show, to my understanding, what epigenetics is all about. And the basis of everything that I've told you right now, and you probably have already uh, thought so, is the DNA coded through base pairs. And they really develop a specific code for each of us, which is unique unless you've got a genetically identical twin. And these sequences can be interpreted like a computer code. So these DNA sequences are, can be read like zero and ones. And at the end of day, there's a protein biothesis. Proteins are synthesized and they then lead to characteristics of features. Everything that happens leads to your colors of eyes, size, your voice, and even your behavior to a certain extent. And all this then is called gene expression. What happens once your genes are read, once prote proteins are synthesized, and then a characteristic is developed or a feature is developed that makes the you. And all this is based on the uh, three different bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And they are showing up in different sequences or orders in genes. And they then come in different orders and then they can be read in synthesis. So now we come back to epigenetics. Epigenetics tries to find out how this gene expression, that is this synthesis of uh, proteins and this development of specific features can be switched on or off. 
and how environment plays into this. And one epigenetic process, well, there are different ones, but one epigenetic process is the so-called methylation of cytosine. And now somebody took over the control of the presentation. I hope that you see the chart with the four bases. So could you please show the slide epigenetics and methylation? And now my notes are also gone. That's not really very good. OK, I continue without notes. So the methylation of cytosine regulates the gene expression. Yeah. Ruben, we don't know who's got the control, but I could take over control and continue for you. Okay, yeah, then please go ahead. Or would you like to share again? Uh, well, we've got plenty of time, so I think that I just share again. And don't take over Ruben's control, or only under certain conditions. Okay, uh, trusting the cloud, we've got very democratic rights. <laughs> That's a very social approach, Simon. Okay, so now we are back. That's it. Thank you. So thank you for the challenge. Whoever did it, I'm really proud of myself of having stayed calm. Okay, coming back. So we just said epigenetics is looking how methylation of cytosine can regulate the gene expression and thus influence DNA. And this methylation can happen through environmental factors and uh, will not be too biological and chemical. But here the important point is, so here you see the switch. You've got the four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And if a methyl group, so a carbon and hydrogen atom, is linked to a gene sequence, then it's switched off. So no proteins are produced anymore. And this is Shield and Domschke used this in 2017 and found out that methylation of a specific gene corresponds with a successful therapy. What did they do? They looked at angst therapy patients, extracted DNA, analyzed it, and saw, oh, on a specific gene, which, uh, which is responsible for the enzyme monenzyme oxidase A, this is not methylated. And due to the non-methylated methylation, it is produced endlessly. Well, monoamine oxidase A is an enzyme which is depleting dopamine and serotonin. It is excessively de depleting it. You know that neurodamine and dopamine are neurotransmitters which at the synaptic gap really control, uh, regulate everything. Our mood and serotonin is, among other things, responsible for the stabilization of mood. So if we don't have sufficient serotonin, then we are not well balanced and calm. We might be even more fearful, and then this could even lead to depression. So if there's not sufficient amount of serotonin, then this is not good for us. The same is true for dopamine. This is the uh, happiness hormone. It's also a neurotransmitter. It is uh, controlling motivation and learning. And monoamine oxidase A, the enzyme, is excessively depleting these two neurotransmitters. And that's not normal. And we can probably agree if uh, serotonin and dopamine are not available sufficiently, then we cannot learn properly. Then we might be over anxious. And what uh, Sheila and Domschke have found out, that is prior to the therapy they had, the DNA uh, was extracted, there was no methylation of this uh, gene, uh, uh, this uh, um, on the gene, but after therapy, once a therapist and the uh, person said the therapy is successful, I'm less fearful, I'm normally fearful, but not excessively fearful, then they also did a DNA extraction and suddenly saw, oh, suddenly there's a methylation group at the gene which is responsible for the enzyme mono I mean, oxidase A. So it was stopped at that moment and this excessive depletion of serotonin and dopamine was changed. And just keep that in mind and digest this. When I researched this for the presentation, I thought, that's madness. This is really... Uh, 
great environmental influence change or can change the uh, expression that we see. So uh, an angst disorder can be uh, prevented or overcome. I thought that is really uh, awesome. And a therapy at the end of the day is that you learn something. You learn something about yourself at the end of the day. So possibly even learning processes can be influenced through epigenetic processes through the switch on and off. So my mind was blown when I understood how this worked. And I was extremely enthusiastic. So you don't have to exchange genes. You can just use learning processes and change DNA expression. I thought that's really huge. Okay, and what is important for you and for all of us here in the room, the research on this topic has just started. So I cannot really present endless studies to you which say how you should do uh, learning environments and that it really makes very much sense and that there are thousands of scientific proofs that this is the case. That's not yet so. However, I think all of you here, because you all move in this field of learning, have the potential to influence the societal development. If you know scientists, for example, psychologists, uh, biochemists, and if you've got a great topic where you say, well, about learning environments and how they should be crafted, and shouldn't we do a research and look how this has an impact on specific genes, whether it has epigenetic effects, I can only really encourage you to do that. I personally believe if you have a stimulating learning environment, which really has diverse sensory, cognitive and social experience, then epigenetic changes might happen. And this is not a research question, but an idea, first of all. For example, imagine that neuroplasticity could be changed through learning environments. So synapses at the end of the day are only proteins, and the processes that happen are controlled and steered by proteins. And thus it could be that there are specific genes which are responsible for the protein uh, uh, synthesis for synapses and epigenetic effects could then have or facilitate the development of synapses and their processes. This is something that would have to be researched. And if synapse activity were reinforced or improved, then it could be that we learn quicker, better and more efficiently. And, uh, also think more quickly and the brain works better. But we also might find out that during the development as a child or adult, we had specific environmental influences which changed our possibility to memorize things so that, that environmental effects were due to this. What is really important for us for because of Lernos and Marcel Kirche, the learning circles and learning circle guides are important to us. I'm an enthusiast for learning circle guides at our company. And I can only tell you that I truly believe that learning circles really lead to a situation that social influence in learning, learning group development, whatever they choose, whether it's OneNote or Minecraft, that they will make sense and we will see epigenetic changes in learning in a positive way. I can't prove it, but this is certainly something that should be researched scientifically. To conclude, I believe, and I'm not an expert for artificial intelligence, and I don't even want to present myself as such, but I believe if you imagine that an artificial intelligence like ChatGPT or similar knows what I explained to you, and this is a fact. So biopsychology, what I told you, that's true. It's not invented. And ChatGPT knows about this. They know that it's important for people that it's how to design learn environment. There's a clear link. Learn environments can influence uh, learning and this on a DNA expression. And this means artificial intelligence could support us in this. That is in the creation of learning environments, because they would immediately link out, oh, have a look at this, at this, try this, try Minecraft, try a different tool, whatever it might be. And these imp this impetus could come from uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and the human being, which could add a bit of diversity. And all this could really change a lot, if not everything, regarding the topic of learning. So, to conclude, we can say, I personally believe 
to repeat this, it's important and makes sense to me to talk about learning environment. Thanks, Simon, for having brought this topic up for this one. We, I believe that learning environments matter and LOSCON 23 matters. Thanks for your attention and I look forward to seeing you at my breakout tomorrow.